Hello, and welcome to Focus on Liberia. I'm Anthony Sia Broadcasting. This is Focus on Liberia, and as always, we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome. Today is Thursday. It is our Thursday special here at Focus on Liberia. In this Thursday edition of our show, we are looking at a very, very, very significant topic. And if you have joined, joined us, please carefully pay attention because this subject is very crucial and it has something to do about Liberians living in the United States. Folks, our topic, Liberia's U.S. immigration hurdles. That is what we are going to be discussing. But before we get to the hurdles, we will talk about the Onto Liberia America story. To do this, I have a special guest. His name is Reverend Tolle Kriya. He is the uh, member of the a, 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 an institution that has been advocating uh, for status for Liberians here in the United States. Uh, Reverend Kriya is a member of the Free Liberia Movement. He is also a member of the Universal Human Rights Institution. And by the way, he is the campaign consultant uh, for that institution. He is here and we are here to talk about immigration in Li in the United States. That is Liberian uh, living in the United States who have been having a hard time getting status. Welcome. Welcome and welcome to the broadcast. I'm Anthony C.A. hosting. Uh, before I can bring uh, Reverend Krua in here quickly, this is what I want to show you, and this is what we will be discussing. The Onto Liberia American story, we will discuss that, and we will also talk about the Liberia's U.S. immigration hurdles, and then after that, we will also talk about resolutions, solutions, and recommendations that Reverend Kura uh, will have for us here, uh, focus on Liberia in finding solutions to the issues uh, Liberians in the United States are facing. At this time, I will welcome my guest, uh, Reverend Kura. Welcome to Focus on Liberia. I'm happy to have you. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, there you have it. Uh, Reverend Kura is our guest, and we are here to talk about immigration in the United States. Welcome, and again, welcome. Hit that share button for us as we go into this discussion. So, Reverend Kura, the institution that you are a member of that have been advocating, and I know you have been affiliated with three institutions, by the way, the Free Liberia Movement, the Universal Human Rights International, and also you have been working with lawyers from the uh, Howard University of Law School. Uh, so let's talk immigration. How long you been doing this, first of all, before we get to the story? So my background is in computers and my background is in computers and telecommunications. Mm -hmm. uh, but when the war happened and I came to this country, uh, there was a shift in what I needed to do. And I started this journey of immigration advocacy from around 1990. So it's been about 30 plus years in, in advocacy for Liberians and other people. All right, thank you so very much. So the Universal Human Rights International, uh, so what work uh, does this institution uh, do that is in connection with uh, immigration issues in the U.S.? So Universal Human Rights aims to assist refugees to advocate for, this, for their own rights as human beings. As okay. human beings, refugees in the United States have a right to live here. They have a right that's protected by international laws and, and international conventions, including the 1951 uh, Geneva Convention on Refugees, and they don't need to go through the type of stuff we've been going through in this country. For example, since 1991, when Liberians were given a, a temporary protected status, um, they, they, they lived 
and work here on temporary protective status. We had a situation where today, almost 30 years later, there are still Liberians living in the United States who don't have temporary protective status, who cannot work. We have a snowstorm, relentless snowstorm back to back. We have a pandemic that is ravaging the lives of people. We have federal laws that, that criminalizes uh, cruelty to animals. So if you leave your dog outside in the court, you could go to jail for seven years. And yet we have Liberians that have been here for decades. And this government of the United States has not been able to uh, grant them their basic human rights, access to humanitarian assistance, and permits to work for themselves, to support themselves. So we have been uh, advocating for refugees, but we've also been training people to advocate for themselves. Thank you so very much. Let's go into the crumbs of what we are here for. Uh, you are a Liberian, and uh, you and this institution have been on this journey of trying to make sure Liberians here in the United States you know, have the necessary status so that uh, they can be able to live their lives, you know, uh, in freedom, if I can pull it that way. But one of the things that you have been consistent in talking about is this Liberia America story. And you saying that uh, because of this connection, this ties that we've had over the time, uh, we Liberians should be the last group of people having trouble with status in America. So my question I'm asking here is, what is this Liberia America story in short? The untold Liberia America story is that this country was founded on the proposition that all men are created equal mm -hmm. in 1776. But in 1790, the United States Congress passed a law. It was the first apartheid law in the world. They passed a law on March 26, 1790 that says only white persons could be citizens of the United States of America. So you go back a few years, all men are created equal, and you come back a few years and they say only persons who were white, meaning only white Europeans could be citizens of this country. And what that law did was to completely dehumanize people who have lived here for, for, for centuries and millenniums. Native Americans, it completely dehumanized them. They could not be citizens of the United States. It also dehumanized people who were mixed race, mulatto, and black people who were in this country. It completely dehumanized them. They could not be citizens of the United States. It became the nation of immigrants, meaning the nation of European immigrants. That creation of the apartheid laws, the first apartheid law in the world that dehumanized a whole class of people from their, their God-given rights, their inalienable rights, was the beginning of the Liberia story. What it did was after passing that law, almost all of the people, most of the people in Congress who voted for that law were slave owners, including the president, George Washington, who owned up to 600 slaves himself. He signed that law. So from that point moving forward, the United States of America decided, since we have now dehumanized these people, now we have to remove them from the United States. Liberia was created by the United States of America as a dumping ground of the people who they felt could no longer be, or are no longer worthy to be citizens of the United States. And that's how come in 1816, they created an organization, the American Colonization Society, which has four presidents, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, Andrew Jackson, four American presidents, all owners of slaves, came together along with other people like Bushrod Washington uh, to create Liberia. And they gave it the name Liberia, it was a deception. Liberia was not created by black people who were anxious to go to Africa. It was created by slave masters who wanted to protect the institution of slavery by dehumanizing a whole class of people. That's how Liberia started. So in 18, on March 3, 1819, Congress, the United States Congress passed a second law 
First law to dehumanize these people who were not white. Second law was to remove them and carry them as far away as possible that they will never come back to the United States. That's how Liberia was started. In fact, in July of 1824, after Liberia was started, they passed a law. The first constitution of Liberia says, anyone born in Liberia is entitled to all rights and privileges of citizens of the United States. So these people whom they have, they have uh, dehumanized and they have deprived them of their rights and they are now colonizing them in Africa, they still said they could have all rights of American citizens. Today, as the Congress is debating a law talking about immigration rights, you will see that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that is there talking about the rights of Native Americans. There's nothing that's talking about the rights of Liberians who were dehumanized, removed, and colonized in Africa, or even the Africans that were subjected to atrocities because of the colonization. There's nothing that has been said about that. And so what we need to do now is not just to clap and say, yes, Congress is doing great things for, for us. We need to say first things first. Congress needs to mitigate those racist laws that they created seven, March 26, March 26, 1790. Those racist laws that were created March 3, 1819. The racist laws that were created in May of 1830. Indian Removal Act to remove people from this country. It those until those racist laws are mitigated, Congress has not done its work because they are following the footprints of those people who dehumanize, colonize, and remove and banish Native Americans and Black people from this country for no justifiable reasons. And so, Reverend Crow. Uh Bringing it specifically to Liberia, why do you feel so strongly that Liberians should be the last group of people uh, to be having trouble with, uh, you know, status in the United States? Uh, looking at the history and the ties, why why you feel that way? Because the problem, as I said, was created by the United States Congress, and the problem has to be resolved by the United States Congress. On the 6th of July, 2021, mm -hmm. an angry mob of people attacked the United States Congress. They were armed with lies. They were armed with lies because they said President Trump had won the elections when in fact he had not won the elections. They've gone through court sections. Lies were weaponized on the 6th of, of uh, January, 2021. Mm -hmm. And this country has a court, united we stand, divided we fall. This is a deeply divided country. And if lies have threatened and attacked the very seat of government, the first thing Congress and anyone with sense needs to do is to tackle the question of lies. How do we tackle the question of lies? A truth commission to find out what is actually the truth about colonization, about these apartheid laws. Today in Liberia, we have high unemployment. Today, we the roads in Liberia are impassable. The seeds that were sown by American colonization and the Congress in Liberia bore fruits of atrocities, rape, torture. Nobody knows about it. And it continues to ravage the lives of people in Liberia. But worse, it's ravaging the lives of Liberian refugees right here in the United States on a five administration. President Bush administration, those people were brought into the United States by United States Marines on a program called Operation Shining Express. Marines went to Monrovia, airlifted American citizens who were young children and their Liberian mothers, brought them here to the United States. And on the Operation Shining Express, they were promised temporary protected status. 20 years later, they don't have temporary protected status. No justification at all. Under President Bush, under two terms of the Biden Obama administration or the Obama Biden administration, those people lived here in the snow and under President Trump. Two terms of Obama, President Trump, now we are under President Biden. And on the first day of his inauguration, President Biden, being a compassionate man, signed a renewal of DED. 
but that renewal did not impact anyone who had been denied temporary status from 2002. And so now we started a, a, a campaign from, from February 14th, which is uh, uh, Valentine's Day up to Easter Sunday. And the campaign is to have equal protection for all Liberians. This country, the United States of America, does not need to continue this generation after generation of racism, putting people's life at risk when dogs and cats have been protected by the Constitution of the United States. Seven years, if you put your, if you have cruelty to animals, if you leave your dog out in the open, seven years jail sentence. But what do you do when the United States Marines bring African Americans or Liberian Americans to the United States from the war zone? and you keep them for 20 years without giving their parents that you brought here permits to work. I think Americans don't know. I think it's not a question that most Americans don't care, but Americans don't know because this is an untold story. It's the darkest secret of the United States of America. Thank you so very much, folks, following us here, focus on Liberia. I'm Anson is here hosting this is Toss the Special. We are in a conversation with Reverend Craw. He is a member of the Universal Human Rights International, a group that is advocating for legal status for Liberians and other nationals here in the United States. Uh, Reverend Craw, is Liberia using its Liberia American history to her advantage, you explain clearly here that, hey, there has been the tide. Liberia was that nation that was created when the U.S., you know, through the American colonization, wanted to see some blacks out of this place. So it was like Liberians were taken from here or Americans were taken from here and taken back to Liberia. And so when they come back, you know, because the argument I'm understanding you're making is when they, when they are brought back to their country, why should they have issues with status? But there's a history now. Is Liberia using its Liberia American history to her advantage? Absolutely not. Absolutely not because of deception. The Liberians don't even know their own history. Liberians are known to say our country was not colonized by any country in the world. Totally false. There was a United States, there are two United States laws that created Liberia. The first United States law created by Congress that created the, the Liberia, the colony of Liberia was the law of 7th March 26, 1790 that says no black person could be citizens of the United States, only white person could be citizen. And then you fast forward to March 3, 1819. The second law created by Congress, it says that it was the law for colonization. Now, Liberians say on the one hand, our country was not colonized by any country in the world. That's completely lie because on March 3, 1819, Congress passed a law and that law was to provide quote, logistics for the creation of a colony in Africa. Congress passed a law that created logistics for the creation of an American colony in Africa. Number two, it authorized the United States Navy to carry out that colonization. Number three, it appropriated $100,000. $100,000 back in 1819 was a lot of money. So when you put taxpayers' money towards a project, when you put the United States military towards a project, when you, when you state clearly that this project is for the establishing of colony, clearly the United States has established this colony and the, they planted the American flag on the territory upon arrival. So no matter how you look at it, the United States government is liable for colonization in Liberia and also how to be held accountable for the ravages of colonization, which included massacres, rape, torture, 
in Liberia, but Liberians have been saying they have not been able to take advantage of it because most Liberians don't know. Most Liberians don't know that there is a law, 1824 law that says all persons born in Liberia are entitled to all rights of American citizens. They don't know that. And so what we need to do is we have to teach Liberians to find out why. Why is it that America, Americans going to Liberia are never denied a visa, but Liberians coming here are denied visa. Not only are they denied visa, the United States Embassy in Monrovia has established a business, an illegal business of actually extracting money from Liberians, millions of dollars every year by just denying Liberians visa to come to the country built by the blood and sweat of their ancestors. And at the same time, people from other countries, we're talking about agricultural workers. We have unemployment in Liberia. Why shouldn't Liberian workers be entitled to this also? We have to make a demand. Uh, Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. And once we create the awareness, then we have to make a demand of the government of the United States. And they have no ground to stand on because everything we are talking about is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And they cannot, and then, they cannot. And Mary Crow, I was just gonna say, uh, the law that was passed then that you just quoted, giving Liberians the right to uh, US citizenship, or I should say privileges, is that law still in existence? Absolutely, yes. The law is still in existence. So yes. when the law is in existence, let me hold you there. If the law is in existence, it said that the U.S. government does not know for which it is requiring or asking Liberians to apply for visa, pay for it, and then you know come to America when there's a lot of hey, you dare to enjoy the privileges, or it say just that hey, this is just the process, and when you come, or uh, you should be able to uh, get status or uh, automatically. I understand that is not the case also. So I'm just asking, it could be that the law is not working. Maybe that law is no longer in existence and why they have to do all these things. Don't you think so? Here is, here is the thing. Deception was part of dehumanization. There was systematic deception. There was systematic destruction of the black family. There was systematic de deception that started the whole Liberia progress. I mean, the whole Liberia project. Let me tell you. When the American flag was planted in Liberia, the D, the title D for Liberia, what is written on it for Americans? The land was given to Americans. Even if you read Liberian history book, the land was given to Americans. And they took that piece of land, and instead of just sitting on that piece of land, they started expanding by force. How many people know about that in America? Zero. And so the reason the law has not been enforced is that Congress passed this law. Congress removed the legitimate owners of the land and legitimate people with their inalienable rights. Congress removed them and started to welcome European immigrants. And those people that were brought here, they never studied, they never told them the truth about the country. They never told them the truth about, about what the United States, about the first American apartheid law, about colonization. You can get a PhD in American history and know nothing about what I'm telling you about. And so you have a generation of... Reverend Cry, you stay here? Go ahead. Yes, I just saw something flashing. You have a generation of immigrants that have come year after year and more generations of immigrants that have no idea about the atrocities that were created here. So who's in power today? Who's in Congress? I bet 100% of those who are in Congress don't even know about these atrocities. I bet 100% of those in Congress today, generations and generations of immigrants have no idea about the Indian Removal Act and how many people were killed in the process. They have no idea that the first batch of, of uh, American settlers, 80% died in Africa from malaria. They have no idea about Machida Newport and the atrocities committed against Africans. We need to demand truth, a truth commission for the United States. I think truth is the most important thing because without truth, 
this country is going to collapse. In fact, it already started collapsing right before our eyes. People in Congress don't know. Somebody needs to tell them. And we are the ones who must tell them about the atrocities. We must tell them about the privileges. We must tell them about the damages that they inflicted on people, on African tribes in, in, in Liberia and continue to inflict on Africans uh, in Liberia because some of the people in government in Liberia are citizens of the United States, are persons of the United States. And we have 10 presidents of Liberia, African-American. There's a new book, 10 African-American presidents. We have more African-American presidents than the United States of America. And so we are the only ones who can educate. We are the only ones who can make a demand and demand damages from the atrocities of American apartheid and American colonization, which is, by the way, still ongoing. Thank you so much, Reverend Nkra. Folks, uh, we have Reverend Nkra here, and we are talking about the Liberia America untold story on immigration. Reverend, you explained the story quite clearly. That was many, many years ago. Uh, colonization, in my opinion, has ended to the greater extent. Maybe it's in some forms now. And African countries, you know, have taken ownership. They, they are preaching sovereignty. So Liberia, uh, somebody may argue it's a sovereign nation. The question is, can America be blamed for Liberia's problem today? Absolutely, yes. Two reasons. Number one, look, who gave, like, by the way, not all colonization has ended because there are still places that are still being colonized by Europeans and Americans. If you go in, in the West Indies, you will find some places, territories that are still controlled by the British crown and, and the same as the United States of America. Who came up with the name Liberia? Was it the black people? Was it the Africans? Or was it the, the American colonizers and slave owners? Liberia was created as a bit. Like you go fishing, you put the you put the bit on the fish and throw it in the water, telling the fish, I'm here to feed you. Lo and behold, that you're there to feed yourself. Liberia was a bit, Liberia, Liberia, if Liberia was truly free, the name would not be Liberia. It will be something else. It will be an African name. We do not have, Liberia does not have one street, not one monument in honor of, of, of abolitionists, not Frederick Douglass, not Sojourner Truth, not anybody else, not Lord Garrison, but we have our capital city in the name of a slave owner, James Monroe, who owns 260 slaves in his lifetime. And in 1826, after Liberia, Monrovia was named and Liberia was named in 1822, in 1826, James Monroe, two of his slaves ran away from his, his estate. A Phoebe, a guy called Phoebe and a guy called George, they ran away and this, James Monroe guy put up an ad in the newspaper, ten dollars reward to bring them back into captivity. They were not, they were not good people, and so they have to be blamed. They sow a seed that continues to germinate and bear fruits today. You reap what but, you sow because yeah, they sow the seed of deception. They sow the seed of colonization. They sow the seed of dehumanization. We are today reaping the fruits, and they can be held accountable. Last thing I have to say, look, if you claim sovereignty of Liberia, first of all, when Zimbabwe became free, when Rhodesia became free, they changed their name from Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. They changed their capital city from Salisbury to Harare. What's about Liberia? Ghana, when Gold Coast became independent, they changed their name from Gold Coast to the Republic of Ghana. The name Liberia existed it was created by the slave owner before independence. So fast forward to 1847, what happened on July 26, 1847? The same name that was given by the slave master, they took that name and said, we are free. Our name is the, the name the slave master gave us, Liberia, which was a deception. Number two, what was the flag that was flown over this independent sovereign state on July 26, 1847? The American flag, you know? So you have the American flag, you have U.S. dollars. Even today, if you go to Liberia, you want to get a passport, you got to use U.S. dollars for your passport. We are not a free country. We are still a colony by name, by our culture, 
by our economy, by everything. We are still a colony of the United States, but we have not been getting the benefit of the colonization because it's been atrocities, it's been dehumanization, it's been everything. But freedom. Reverend Crow, Reverend Crow, I know you gave your reasons, but I mean, I'm just listening and still wondering uh, because if I look at the liberal, uh, liberal legislature right now, the liberal legislature, I see social indigenous in there, even if there are any uh, members of them that are maybe uh, American Liberians, you know. Uh, children or descendant of American Liberians. I mean, they were born there and, and then raised there many, many years ago. How does what happened many years ago that some of them they experienced, that their grandparents even did not experience, is impacting how they decide what kind of money to use and how they govern their own country? How? Easy. See, I told you in the beginning what you sow is what you reap. Okay. Right now, you have people in the in the uh, legislature in Liberia mm -hmm. whose only idea about public service is how much money they can put in their pockets. In fact, we have a situation in Liberia where the voters or the people who are the citizens of the country do not determine the the salaries of the people who they voted for. The 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 the, the government officials determine their own salary. The library was created to enrich and empower the politician. That's the way it was in 1847. That's the way it is now. In 1847, the, the country that, that claimed independence, which I think was not independent, made it impossible for indigenous Africans to be citizens of the Republic. They were not citizens, not until 1951. So. If it was independent, if we say Liberia is independent, when did Liberia really become independent? When did Liberia share its colonial past? It has not. And today they make more money. Those in Liberian government make more money than public servants in the United States. Most of them have green cards. Some of them have US citizenship, but what's about the people on the street? What I'm talking about is not just about those of us that are here in America, the United States colonization that has mm -hmm. ravaged the life of people over there needs to be, the damage needs to be repaired down to people in West Point. It needs to be repaired down to people in Balatua, all over that country. It has not been mitigated at all. And it has to be. And so Reverend Crabb, then my next question becomes, uh, will you say things will be better in Liberia the way you really want it or you imagine it if we have not had this I think sometimes you call it the original scene of America, you know, creating a free slave, taking blacks there. I mean, will we be a better country if we have not had this history, you know, about the white men creating this African country, imposing their will and culture and how they should live? Had that not happened, will Liberia be a better country? If your answer oh, yeah. is yes, then show me a country that is a better country uh, that faced a particular scenario. Oh, yeah. Liberia, Liberia will be a better country if we don't have the ravages of colonization, the ravages of dehumanization, the ravages of exploitation that was sown over there by the American Colonization Society and the United States Congress. United States Congress is liable. If we didn't have them, Liberia will be a better place for one reason. There is racialistic killing in Liberia. The racialistic killing that happens in Liberia happens because the government was created to empower and enrich the politician. That's the way it was created. We, we could be better off without racialistic killing, number one. Number two, the infrastructure, the basic infrastructures in the country has been decimated because of greed and because people think that they can be American and also be in Liberia as their farm. We have people in Liberia right now who have all the opportunity in the top brass of government who have all the opportunity. They can go to Harvard. Some of them have been to Harvard. They, they can go and buy a house here. They can get a job in America. And American taxpayers have, are paying for their loot of our country. Liberia will be a better country without that sort of scenario at all. And so what we need to have is to have people created by God. We have the same son 
over everyone. We have the same air we all breathe. We as Africans, we as Liberians, could have had a better country without the ravages of colonization, dehumanization, exploitation, which is still going on today, there and here, as we have relentless snowstorm. Why should Liberians be in the snowstorm without protection? And, and Reverend Crowd, what could, what is your definition of a better country? I mean, I'm still trying to figure out here how the Americans not gone to Africa to create this country called Liberia. Would Liberians uh, be able to gain independence? How? We not even independent. I mean, what, folks, uh, I lost my guest there, Reverend Kura. I'm sure he's going to join us. And the question I'm asking is, this happened many years ago, and he's saying it's having an impact on us because uh, he said, whatever you sow, uh, that is what you reap. If you plant pumpkin, you will harvest pumpkin. And he's <laughs> saying, uh, when the settlers went, they were taking, the American went there, and they established this country. They carried their culture. They carried their weight of government and all that. And, you know, and that is why we are today. I mean, I'm having it, finding it difficult. Because, Reverend, the reason is that here in America, they have the same system that they took there. No, I we can talk that. about the nuances and all that. Why right? we can talk about the corruption and all that, but that system has established an economy that is working for, if not most of them, but to the greater extent that they have infrastructure and school systems and all that. It's not perfect. It's never going to be. And so, for you to say that, you know, that which they did, that's what got us to this. So how? I take you to my village. I was born in a village which today does not have electricity. We don't have running water. We don't have a prison. We don't have prison. We don't have a courthouse. That's where I was born. And people live there. They lived there for, for years and years and years. They still live there. And when we have crisis among ourselves and dispute, we resolve those disputes without shooting one another. Um, but what I'm, what I'm talking about is our system works in that village. It still works in that village. And we don't have ritualistic killing. We don't have exploitation. But when you have people coming to a place who think they are better than the other people and they establish a system, a system of exploitation where those who are in public service use the public service to enrich themselves as we see them do all the time, that's the only thing they know. And so our country could have been a better place without the exploitation, but it can still be better if we hold America accountable for America to mitigate, for the Congress to mitigate those things that they started in Liberia that continues today. For example, American taxpayers are bankrolling these politicians in Liberia. If you compare the salary of Nancy Pelosi, the, the Speaker of the House of the United States, $223,000 a year. Compare that with the Speaker of Liberia, $440,000 a year. And the budget of the speaker, $1.2 million a year. It doesn't make sense at all. American taxpayers are incentivizing corruption in Liberia and nothing has been done by it because most of the people are American citizens. Most of them are uh, green card holders. Reverend they don't Crown, need to go to. Uh, what you are saying there is you, you are saying that, hey, uh, America should step in Liberia and say, hey, don't pay these people this money. And that's basically what you're saying. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that America has created a problem. America needs to create a law that mitigates the problem. What they created is falsehood. It's the thing that tried to destroy Congress. It's the lies. You cannot continue with lies all the time. For example, they say, we never colonized this country. What was your flag doing in a country that you don't colonize? What was your Navy doing in a country that you didn't colonize? What was $100,000 of taxpayers' money doing in a country that you didn't colonize? Of course, the United States did colonize Liberia. And you, then you talk about the atrocities. Matilda Newport massacred a whole bunch of people using a cannon. Where did she take the cannon from? 
It was the property of the United States Navy. Wow. Did she really fire that cannon? Because some people, have, some historians are saying that that is not even true. That didn't happen. Whether that, that particular incident was true or false, the truth is violence was used to subdue people in Liberia. That's what happened. They used violence to subdue the people, and that is exactly what happened in that country. And you cannot tell me they didn't use violence because I can tell you from Nimba, from, from uh, Maryland, there were battles that were fought where, where the, the, the Republic of Liberia asserted its authority over people by shooting them. That's not, that's not false. Will you dispute that as well? All right, let's come to Liberians' U.S. immigration hurdle. And my first question in this segment is, what are the hurdles Liberian immigrants are facing in the U.S. today? What we are facing here is most Americans don't know what problems we face. Like I said, they, they created this law and removed the legitimate Americans from this country, packed them in reservations, sent some of them out of the country. And the new generations of, rev, of, of immigrants that are coming know nothing about the atrocities. They know nothing about the dehumanization. They know nothing about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, exploitation. And so they become the new American leaders. And as the new American leaders, they don't know Liberians and the history of the Liberians. As a result, you can see today in Congress, they're trying to pass a law, uh, immigration law, that has nothing for Liberia. They're talking about agricultural workers. They don't address the issue of the problem they created in Liberia. And so we are always at the short end of the stick. Like I said earlier, 53,000 Chinese that came here were given DED and then giving a green card in the first two years, 250,000 of Salvadorans, you know, 150, so, 150 Guatemalans. So many people have come here and Liberians continue to be overlooked till this very day because of that history of deception. And so what we need to do now is to create awareness. We need to create awareness about the plight of Liberian people by speaking the truth, telling the truth about the history of this country, telling the truth about the history of Liberia and making a demand. Power concedes nothing without a demand. We have to make a demand for uh, payment of damages for what the American colonization society and the United States Congress did in Liberia. We have to, to call for, uh, for uh, for damages to be paid to Liberia okay. and to Thank all you. Liberians. This is not just about people in the United States that are struggling. People in Liberia are struggling too. So we have to put that together and make a comprehensive awareness and comprehensive demand for damages. Reverend, the uh, recent, the, the, the legislation that the Democrats have introduced today I know you, asked, you, you said that you're not sure if there's anything in there that cover Liberians who are not on DED and even TPS. Let me read something uh, that I just got. The legislation entitled U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021 includes an eight-year pathway to citizenship for nearly 11 million undocumented uh, immigrants. So it did not specify, I think it's inclusive for all immigrants, I think Liberians or some Liberian fall in that category. Don't you think so? Some Liberian fall in that category and that makes my point. My point is, it's like somebody stole from you and mm -hmm. then bring the food and say, well, you're not going to eat it until 10 years from now. The United States of America has stolen from Liberia. That That's the, that's the fact. We have the Liberian Refugee Fairness Act because they were so unfair to us. Why should Liberians have to wait for another eight years? We have to make a demand of immediate, immediate inclusion of Liberians, of every single Liberian on American soil in the Fairness Act because they were the ones who were unfair. They were the one who hosted the war laws. They were the one who hosted the war and they had no business discriminating against Liberians for 30 years 
how much time do people have to live? They're already still 30 years from us. And we got to wait for another eight years. I don't think it's reasonable at all. And I think we need to push for for Liberia specific legislation to be there. And we, we are we are going to do it because this is just a beginning. We need to have an input of Liberia specific. You just can't exclude Liberians for, for, for no justifiable reason forever and ever. And also make a provision for investigation because the United States State Department sent a cable to Liberia in 1990 telling the people at the embassy do not give any visa to Liberian uh, passport holders. And because of that, a lot of people who are relatives in the United States died right in front of the embassy. And that was completely illegal. You cannot discriminate against people because of their nationality. We have a uh, Indian born Liberian who was recently appointed as the head of President Biden's malaria initiative. If he was Liberian, he left Liberia when he was nine years old. If he was a Liberian, he was not even going to leave because of that cable that is saying denying every Liberian from leaving that country. They can stay there and die. You know, we need to tell the truth. And I think everything begins with the truth, and it's the truth that sets people free. So, Thank you, Reverend Kra. That, mm -hmm. that, that legislation is flawed. We need to add a Liberian specific thing to it to get fairness, not just for the Liberians that are in the United States, but the Liberians that are in Liberia that have been exploited for 200 years as well. Thank you. And then we'll get to some specific issues on that uh, visa issue and thing that you also uh, want to talk about. The Liberian refugee, Fagner Ad shows America cares for Liberians. And I'm saying this because in that particular uh, bill that was passed, Liberians were the only group of people who were given this extraordinary uh, incentive, if you like, uh, almost like a pathway to, to citizenship. That was, uh, I think, from November of 2014, Liberians that came into the country, whether they came for a visit, whichever way they got here, these Liberians now can apply for green card. So the question I'm asking is that, looking at this statement, a Liberian refugee ad shows America cares for Liberia. What do you think? Don't you think America cares? What I think about that statement is power concedes nothing without a demand. Senator okay. Jack Reed cares because mm -hmm. it took him decades fighting for that one bill. Every time he carries mm -hmm. it, it fails. He brings it back again and again and again. And I think that Americans need to know if we can make them more aware, then they will care. But if we just sit down and let them care, then we're not going to go anywhere. We need to make them to know it's through awareness that they are going to care. And I, that's, that's, how, that's how I think about it. I also want to think about our campaign that we're having right now, leveraging it, not, we're framing the argument, not as a, 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 a Liberian refugee problem, but as an American problem, especially the people of faith. Liberia is a country that has many missionaries uh, organizations, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Lutheran, the Episcopalians, even Franklin Graham has his own operation over there. But when we reach out to Franklin Graham and ask him to advocate for Liberian refugees, he said, no, advocacy for Liberian refugee is not, it's political. I can't do that. At the same time, he's going all around the country campaigning for President Trump. You cannot advocate for refugees from Liberia who are languishing in the cold weather and the pandemic, but you're going to go and campaign for a political leader. You know, so, so we need to hold these people feet to the fire. The Methodists, the Baptists, they need to get involved. If they're going to pray to God in heaven that they have never seen before, they need to reach out and help Liberian refugees right here. And that's the challenge we're going to give them from now until Easter Sunday. Let the people of worship come and, and, and reach out to the poor Liberians at their doorstep, people that they've exploited, people that they've dehumanized, people that they've colonized. Let them reach out to the Liberians. Thank you, uh, Raven. And one of your articles that you wrote, I got this information, and you wrote that Denmark, Finland, Germany, and Canada, Australia, with absolutely no ties to Liberia, welcome Liberian refugees and immediately granted them path to citizenship. 
Why are you trying to get across here with this? What I'm trying to say is that what, I, what I'm trying to say is that the, the, the people who we felt were close to us, the United States of America, in mm. our darkest hour of need, turned their backs on, on Liberians. In 1990, I just told you about the uh, classified cable, which we're going to fight to declassify that cable because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They, they turn their back on Liberia at the darkest hour of our need. They turn their backs on us. And countries like Denmark, Finland, Germany, Australia, Canada, Liberians that went there are doing a lot better today. Today, in 2021, we're talking about Liberians that fled here. We're talking about getting their work permit. Those people have already gotten work permit 30 years ago. They've been able to go to school to get an education. Why President Biden is picking an Indian-born Liberian to make him head of malaria because he has a, a degree in medical science. The Liberians can't even go to school in America today, as I'm speaking to you. It's a disgrace for this country. It's a great disgrace for this country and a bigger disgrace for the people of God or the people who claim to be people of God taking the gospel to Liberia. But when Liberian refugees came here, I've been working for 30 years. I have not been able to get one church group to help in setting aside their time, their talents to work along with this. Evangelical Christians have not been on the forefront of this struggle and they ought to be because this is how you serve God, by serving the least people of God, the people made in the image of God. But uh, these people, I think we got to teach them because they don't know. And Reverend, before we get to some of the resolutions, you know, solutions and recommendations that you may be putting forth, let's come to the issue of visa. You made the argument that Liberians should not even be spending money for visa uh, in Liberia if they want to come to America. You, you, you said that. I mean, this is this is this is a call for, and as though that is not enough, you argue, when Liberians apply for this visa, they are intentionally denied, and at a U.S. embassy in Liberia, I'm using your words here, illegally would collect money from Liberians and deny them visa and will not refund the money. Those are tough language. That's America. They come in here, they need to apply for visa. It applies to every other country. Why are you making noise about this, this law? Three reasons. Number one, Liberia is a different country. Liberia was created by the United States of America and the people who wrote the 1824 constitution to say all people born, all persons born in Liberia will have, will be entitled to all rights of American citizens. Those were white slave owners. They were the ones who drove the people from here. They were the ones who, who made that law and they are the ones who are supposed to uphold the law. The problem is in 1990, when the United States State Department decided they were not going to allow the people who built this country in the first place to come back here, that generations of their children, as well as generation of the people who were oppressed by their children in Liberia to come to this country when they have address to come to, when they have relatives to come to. They were not just coming to America, they were coming specifically to family members. When the State Department decided in 1990, they were going to write a classified cable that says, do not allow anybody with Liberian passport to come to the United States. They did that as a secret deed and made it a classified cable and they never informed the Liberians. People risked their life in the bullets to get to the United States Embassy at Mama Point to try to apply for visa. They never told them, we're not gonna give you visa. They put them through the motion and they will say, oh, tell us where you're going. Tell us how long you're going for. Okay, we're not going to give you visa. One person after another, until an Indian person shows up and they say, bang, we give you visa. Until somebody from Sri Lanka shows up, bang, we give you visa. From I mean, from all over, they give all these people visa and they never told the truth to the Liberian people that we have a document here, which is why we're denying you visa. That is why that, that sort of a, a trick that they play it's like trying to have a scheme of exploitation. 
we hear this all the time. People calling, I'm from, calling from the Social Security Administration. You know, give me your Social Security number. We have money for you, blah, blah, blah. This is the government of the United States of America exploiting poor African people in the colony created by the United States of America. It's, 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 it's actually a crime, I think. And that is why we need to have a copy of that cable declassified. We have written, we are writing to the Black Caucus, Congressional Black Caucus. We are writing to every man of goodwill in Congress to make sure that we declassify that cable. A lot of people died. And today, as I'm speaking to you, a lot of the people who came here are still dying because Americans believe their country is better for somebody else, but not Liberians. Even though they created the country, even though they created the war, they created all of the stuff in our country, they still are denying Liberians. And so let's read the document. Let's read that letter from, from the place. And, and, and once we read that letter, mm -hmm that illegally deny all these people, then of course the money that they've taken from these people, millions of dollars have to be refunded with interest. That's going to be the demand. Thank you. Finally, Reverend Crowell, let's look at uh, some resolutions or recommendations that you are suggesting. So let's talk resolutions, solutions, and recommendations. Now, on the issue of the whole Liberian um, status or immigration thing in America, and also talking about the visa uh, issuance or uh, denials in Liberia, you are saying first, uh, they should investigate the systemic uh, discrimination against Liberians in visa issuing. You said that, and you also saying that uh, you know there should be a reform and with interest all right so it's a request a reform with interest and admission of liberians in to the u.s visa waiver program that Liberia should be admitted into the united states visa waiver program liberians should not pay money to obtain visa and those who have paid money in the past they should refund the money and those they have even denied that money should be given back to them and there should be interest on it this is huge. Is this possible? Well, I'll ask you to invite uh, Representative Ben Swan to your show because he also believes in exactly what I'm talking. In fact, he believes more than what I'm talking about. He He's calling for immediate citizenship for anyone in Liberia who wants to be a citizen of the United States. Um, it is possible. All things are possible to those who believe. You know, mm -hmm. the, the airplane you see flying in the sky, didn't take off from an airport. The first airplane didn't take off from an airport. It took off from the mind of somebody. When you imagine things, when you think about things, and you envision things and work towards it, it becomes possible. All things are possible to those who believe. And with God, all things are possible. We are the children of God. We were created in his image. And these people decided that they were going to demonize, dehumanize us, and exploit us. That was a challenge and contempt for the Almighty. And so God is with us in this battle. God is with us in this struggle. It is possible and it shall come to pass. And that is why we are calling on everyone to get involved, to pray. We are calling on everyone to put their name on the list to support. We are calling on everyone to, to, to sign up, to call President Biden, to call members of Congress. Uh, Representative Swan has already written a letter as uh, president of the Universal Human Rights International. He's written a letter and we are using that letter for everybody to try to sign on. We're calling on people who go to church. Don't go to church, don't go to the mosque until you help these people who are languishing in this country. You can't see God, you're not gonna see God tomorrow, but God instructs everybody who loves God to love their neighbors as themselves. And that is the challenge for people of faith in this season as we start this campaign. Reverend Crow, we will appreciate if you can uh, help us uh, get that gentleman you talk about. We would like to have this conversation with him. We will surely appreciate that. And I think that we help to elevate uh, this discussion on what you are arguing uh, should be a privilege that Liberians should be able to enjoy, be able to be admitted into the uh, visa waiver program because of our historical ties. You see Liberia as 
another territory of, of, of America, but even if that is not the case, that country was created by the US and not only by mob, but you said by law. And so Liberians should come here and they should be able to get automatic citizenship. This is a very, very, very uh, important debate. Uh, we would like to elevate it as we always do here, focus on Liberia, we educate, we elevate and promote all things Liberia. We know Liberians are, are here, they don't have status. Some of them are stuck at homes. Some of them are working under the table. There has been less legislation here and there, but still there are some people who cannot get cover for some reason or the other. And you are saying, given our historical task, given that Liberia is more a territory of America, you are saying Liberians should be the least or last people to be talking about status trouble here in the United States. Thank you. But this is what I want you to close us with, Reverend. You said that this can be possible. This can be done. Now, Liberians can get a visa waiver. Liberian can enter here and become a US citizen. You are even arguing, instead of then going to other South American countries to bring people to come work on agricultural farms, let them go to Liberia. They created Liberia already. There are thousands of young Liberians there with their energy wasting that can come here and get a job done and they should be given status. You are saying Liberians and Americans can get this done. In other words, America and Liberia can get it done. You are a Liberian. From the Liberian angle, how can Liberia, how can Liberians make this happen? That is what I want you to close us with. I was on the Radio Nimba show this morning. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about free Liberia and about exactly what I'm telling you about the plight of Liberians in the United States, as well as the millions of dollars that have been taken from Liberian citizens in Liberia when all of the top officials of government have free pass, when, when 22 million people are allowed to come to this country without visa every year, and I threw the challenge to the people. I told them that this is possible, but it's not going to be one individual or one organization we have to work together. We want people of God to pray. Those who pray need to pray for this. But if they are praying, they need to put their name on the list. I have over 200 people from Bikina that already put their name on the list. And today, as I was on the radio, there were a few people who called from Belege, from villages I don't even know. They called and said they were ready to make contributions and they wanted a mobile money number for them to start making contributions. So as I'm talking to you, people have already started praying. As I'm talking to you, people in Liberia have already started putting their names on paper, like in Buchanan. And people in Nima County have already started making donations to a mobile money number for these people to, 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 to make sure that we continue with the awareness because people need to know without the truth, there's gonna be no way for people to be free. So I'm really delighted in the discussion we've had and today to, to actually hear people from villages calling in to say they are going to contribute money to make sure that we as a people are finally free, that young people who want jobs, like other people coming here for temporary work, will be able to do it. There were a lot of people who called it. So I think we are at a good start. I think the idea that somebody has to do it for us has been erased from the minds of the people. I think the people are going to step up like in Buchanan. Over 200 people already signed. In Nimba, over five persons call in to say, give us the number and then we're going to make our contribution for this uh, particular initiative. It's going to happen. It's already happening now. It's going to happen. It's already happening. And the conversation about it is happening right now here. I focus on Liberia, where we educate, we elevate and promote all things Liberia. Folks, we can't thank you enough for following the conversation here. I focus on Liberia and Reverend Crow. We want to also thank you, want to thank you for advocating for Liberians, not only those here in the United States, but also in Liberia, how they can enjoy what you described as the privileges that they are entitled to given the history of America and Liberia. We can all work together and make this happen. On that note, thank you and thank you. And let's do this again. Get us that gentleman. Let's talk about this earlier. I mean, uh, uh, more. Folks, 
The son that says we are all Liberians is taking us home. Thank you and bye-bye for now. We are Liberians.